It was a pitch black night. The cold wind made a chilling sound and shook the tree branches. Five men, hiding their presence in the noise of nature, were approaching somewhere through the grass. Five pairs of menacing eyes flashed like the eyes of an animal. There was a soft light at the end of their gaze. A bonfire that has almost completely burned down and softly lights up the surroundings. And a sleeping bag next to it. Looking at the sleeping bag's bulge and no movement, it seems like the owner of the sleeping bag is sleeping without a care in the world. He's a kid after all. One of the men smiled inwardly. How dare you sleep in a place like this? Five people exchanged hand signals. They quickly surrounded the sleeping bags as if narrowing the siege. The man in the lead pulled out a dagger. As soon as the blade flashed in the air, the dagger plunged downward. The leather sleeping bag was hit by a dagger and was crushed to the floor, as if it had been empty from the beginning. The man opened his eyes wide. What? It sent shivers down my spine. At that time, a voice fell from above. Here, immediately the gaze moved. A boy on a tree lightly raised his hand. On a face that shined pure white in the moonlight, black eyes stood out like an abyss. I didn't feel any presence at all. Goosebumps appeared on the men's bodies. Since we attacked while armed, it wouldn't be a crime to kill them all, right? The boy thought about something for a moment and then blurted out. The number of attackers looking up at them with bristling eyes was five. There is no doubt that it is many to one. So this is self-defense. The boy, who came to a clear conclusion, broke a tree branch next to him. The boy, who placed a tree branch on the bowstring, calmly aimed the bowstring at them. Try to avoid it. At the same time as those words were said, an arrow was fired. Are you kidding me? What are you doing with those twigs? Before I could even think about it, an arrow flew at the speed of a beam of light and struck a man. A shock bordering on panic struck them. If shooting a tree branch could cause this much impact, that would be it. It's Bista. A man shouted in shock. Huh. The boy responded and leisurely hung a branch on the bowstring again. Almost as soon as I pulled it, the next arrow flew out. You can't avoid invisible arrows. Another man fell to the floor. There was no moaning this time. The faces hidden behind the masks of the remaining three people turned pale. I don't understand what's going on. The smile of a fierce predator spread across his face. The boy hung another branch on the bowstring. I slowly pulled the bowstring while watching the men screaming and running away. The boy's lips moved. The arrow was fired with tremendous power and cut through the darkness of the forest like a wild bird. And soon, ugh, it pierced the neck of the fleeing man. The boy's lips moved again as he continued to pull the bowstring. Tinnitus and the eerie sound of death tore through the air. One arrow, one life. A series of blunt arrows pierced the darkness. If you were thinking about killing, you should have been prepared to die. The last arrow was fired. After killing the five attackers on the tree, the boy jumped to the ground. Helmet calmly searched through the raiders' chests to collect useful items and dug a deep pit near the bonfire. After completely erasing the existence of the five men, he packed his bags and left the scene as if nothing had happened. Under cold gaze, the newborn baby born with the sprout of darkness was pointed out as someone who would be reborn as something evil. With the mother's screams, the baby was thrown into the forest of Pa. This forest, soaked in the thick magic energy and dyed a soft black color, was as dangerous as it looked. The lush bushes and trees changed places secretly, making me lose my sense of direction. And the beautiful flowers contained a poison that could instantly kill even a large man. And monsters, destructive and powerful predators who have been mutated by receiving demonic energy. If these evil things that infested the forest had poured out into the human world, disaster would have come. However, because the sacred barrier blocked the forest of Paw from the outside world, no being could escape this place. Beings with demonic energy cannot cross the border. If it's a place where no one can come out alive, wouldn't it be okay to send away those who shouldn't come out alive? I can't believe there is such a way. While everyone was in admiration, a cruel decision was made. In this way, the Forest of Paw became a place to dispose of those who were difficult to kill but should not live. Aside from the death penalty, the most fearful punishment for criminals was being sent to the Forest of Paw. Anyone who comes out of this place alive is free from all sins. However, among those who were randomly dropped somewhere in this forest by divine magic, none came out alive. Not a single genius scholar, a brave general, or a fearsome wizard. The Forest of Paw was a place of exile from which no one could escape alive. The baby cried quietly and eventually became exhausted and fell asleep soundly, breathing hard. The cold and hunger in the forest were harsh for the weak baby. 
However, a strange power welled up from the round lump that formed inside the body, near the heart, like a seed, and enveloped the body. Not being able to eat or drink was enough to kill the baby, but the baby stubbornly survived for ten days and nights. If I had been discovered by a monster, I would have died, so I should say I was lucky. Finally, on the tenth day, the loose swaddling cloth came off, and a hot breath came through and a bright glow came into my eyes. Crumbling, four pillar-like feet with thick claws sprouting from beneath the flexible spine were firmly stretched out. The teeth of the beast that roared its neck fiercely gleamed white in the moonlight. A huge leopard shining white. However, its size was large enough to cause those who witnessed it to faint. The long, outstretched fangs were threatening enough to tear open and swallow the tender, soft piece of meat in front of me in one go. However, even when faced with prey that could be killed in one bite, the leopard hesitated. It was a baby. There was no trace of fear in the black eyes that opened and wriggled. It was surprising that he didn't burst out crying when he saw a leopard the size of a house. Innocent eyes. The leopard stuck out his tongue and tasted the baby. The rough tongue grazed the delicate skin. The baby was surprisingly calm. As the fragrant and savory smell filled his nose, he quenched his appetite. After hesitating for a moment, he lifted the baby up by the tail. Instead of crying, the baby burst into laughter. It is unclear whether the leopard was taking the fresh delicacy to taste or whether he had other thoughts, but that sealed the baby's fate. The Laga, a huge leopard that occupies part of the paw forest as its territory, leisurely returned to its home with the harvest on its tail. Now, Helmut jumped down without hesitation and crushed his target. The force of the struggle was enormous. It was impossible for Helmut, who had just turned ten, to endure any longer. Helmut quickly reached out and grabbed a sharp stone, and then he hit the head of the struggling rabbit with force. A mixture of blood and brain fluid splashed onto his expressionless face. Alaga, who was leisurely watching from the other side, sauntered over to me. As Helmut stepped aside, Alaga raised her claws and sliced open the rabbit's chest. The floor was soaked with blood rushing out. Alaga gently rolled something out of the rabbit's chest with the tip of her sharp claws. A very small bead with a round shape. It was ominously black, as if it had cut out the darkness. This was the first time Helmut had seen this, as Alaga ate it immediately after hunting it. Just as he was about to stretch out his hand for his first kill, Alaga struck Helmut away with a swing of her tail and swallowed the marble. Helmut looked at him blankly and started dragging the dead rabbit. The meat was his portion. Helmut was lost in thought as he dragged the rabbit. Ilagaga, a leopard, was intelligent, but not used to conveying knowledge or holding conversations. When Helmut asked something, he was so annoyed that he had to explain or answer anything, so he ran away. Because of this, it became a habit for Helmut to be lost in thought. It is difficult to reach the border, but as long as you are born with the sprout of darkness, you cannot break through the sacred barrier that burns all demons. The same bead that was taken out of the rabbit's body was also planted in Helmut's heart. Anyway, I can't go out of Paw Forest because of the sprouts of darkness. Although Alaga belonged to the Forest of Paw, Helmut sometimes felt disconnected from the dark and rough Forest of Paw. It felt strange to have to stay here forever. Perhaps it is because he is human. How can you be sure? Alaga became irritated when I asked her questions, so she swung her tail and broke a tree branch. Alaga let out an annoyed look as she looked up at him. Tell me where you last saw him. They say you have to live on your own when you grow up. Now I'm ten years old. He was ten years old, a mature male leopard. However, in Alaga's eyes, Helmut is a kid who has grown a little more than the size of a pea. You said humans live to be one hundred years old. Where did you see him? In this forest of paw filled with monsters, he is a human strong enough to be recognized by Alaga. That sounds amazing. A strong human being even without the sprouts of darkness. Even with the sprout of darkness, Helmut was incomparably weaker than the monsters in the forest. Helmut was curious about the man's strength. How can humans become as strong as monsters? Finally, Alaga got angry and told him where he had last seen the human. Three days away at Helmut's pace. It was a direction I had never gone before. Alaga turned around and sat down. Helmut got up, glanced at Alaga, and started walking in the direction he said. Helmut walked very quietly and without making a sound. Without Alaga's protection, he is nothing more than strange prey in this forest full of monsters. He wished he could meet that human. Let's look around a little more. After walking for about ten more minutes, I saw something unfamiliar on the other side. A fence twice as tall as Helmut made by stacking branches of various types of trees. Monsters don't weave fences, human traces. But the joy of discovery was short-lived, and Helmut became suspicious. It's so clumsy. Any monster living in the forest of Paw could jump over that much of a fence in an instant. 
Isn't it made for the purpose of preventing it? Helmet suddenly realized. Area marking group. If you break that thing, that person will know that someone has entered their territory. It would be better to give advance notice. If the fence is broken, the human may feel uncomfortable. Helmet climbed the fence with strength in his hands and feet and carefully got down without jumping off. It has been more than 10 years since that human settled here. I didn't know there was a trap inside. It's this way. In front, it was seen that trees had been artificially cut down to create a narrow road. Since you are not visiting with hostility, it is correct to follow the path. However, we also had to keep in mind the possibility that the other party might be hostile to the visitor. It feels strange. Helmut, with a chill down his spine, looked back anxiously. That moment, Puck, something hit him from above and pressed him down. His body collapsed in an instant. Helmut barely managed to turn his head to an angle to prevent his face from falling to the floor. An overwhelming difference in power. My heart was pounding like it was going to explode. What is your name? I felt slightly out of breath. Helmut shouted urgently. Hey, Helmut. Last name. I don't know. Who sent you? The wrinkled, beard-covered face was that of an old man, but its eyes were as cruel as those of a wild beast. Although I had received Alaga's protection, I was accustomed to the murderous gaze aimed at me. But the pressure I felt from the monster in front of me was truly suffocating. Kid, how did you get here? Alaga told me. The strange man, who seemed to be thinking about the name, frowned. The sharp energy has completely subsided. The stranger, who was thinking about something, soon asked, Why did you come to see me? When asked why, I was at a loss for words. The person in front of me was a human being, a particularly strong human being. Helmut was curious about the fact that other humans existed nearby. But strangely, Helmut was unable to respond to the stranger's words. This is my first time seeing humans here. Helmut is 10 years old. Moreover, until now, Helmut's only conversation partner had been Alaga. It is a daunting task for Helmut to believably express what he thinks and feels. Get out of my territory. No. If you miss human warmth, you've found the wrong person. What is human warmth? Are you saying that humans are warm? Helmut asked a question out of habit. There was no way Helmut could understand such an abstract expression. The stranger looked at Helmut intently. Are you a human born in this forest? No, I was sent to this forest after I was born. It must be because of the sprout of darkness. Okay, any child would have been killed, so you must be of noble status. Helmut tilted his head because he couldn't understand what precious status meant. The forest? I want to go out. Oh yes, according to Alaga, this human might know how to get out of the forest. Helmut had never thought of that before. But the moment I said those words out of my mouth, a heavy lump hit me somewhere inside. The vacuum in my chest rang like a bell. Helmut discovered a longing he didn't know he had. I wanted to go out to the forest. It was an instinct, like a salmon swimming up a river, returning to one's origins. The world of humans will not be as beautiful or peaceful as you think. The humans outside have no sharp claws or teeth, and their bodies are weak. But instead of being weak physically, they are vicious and cunning and know how to unite. The reason you were abandoned in this forest is because of the sprout of darkness. As long as it is inside you, even if you escape this forest of paw, you may be chased and fight with humans and face death. Do you still want to go out into the outside world? Helmut nodded without hesitation. If you want to return to the human world, you must first become a human. In his eyes, Helmut was a completely unpolished child who had just escaped from an animal. I will make you human. Helmut didn't understand. I'm human, so why are they making me human? From that day on, Helmut came to live with the assailant. The man, who gave his name as Darian, had Helmut clean out his old cabin. Why do I have to do this? Helmut muttered as he swept away dust with a broom for the first time in his life. Helmut has no concept of hygiene. When a house is dusty and dirty, humans do something called cleaning. In the name of teaching cleaning, Darian gave Helmut a demonstration and threw him a broom and a mop. But looking at the house this dirty, I wonder if Darian has been living without cleaning it all this time. While Helmut was cleaning the house, Darian was making something. Before long, a soft nest made of thin twigs and grass was created in a corner of the hut. It's your bed. When I lay down, it was as cozy as a bird's nest. It was a different feeling than when I fell asleep, leaning against Alaga's body and being bathed in dew. After a short break, Darian shouted at Helmut, who was lying down. Wake up. The work is still unfinished. Darian's voice contained a unique, intimidating aura. Helmut came to his senses and stood up. Darian found clothes from an unknown source and put them on Helmut, who was practically naked, with only a tattered cloth wrapped around his waist. Helmut twisted his body around in discomfort. This is tight and uncomfortable. Humans need to wear clothes. There are only a few, so be careful not to tear them. The next step was food. 
What have you been eating so far? Meat from a game or fruit from a tree? Darian nodded and said, I will tell you what you can and cannot eat, and how to make the inedible edible. The magic that fills the forest of Paw contaminates the plants, making them toxic. Various plants grew in Paw's forest, but there were fewer edible ones than in the outside world. Water means purification. Even in the dig here, the water wasn't polluted. Just remove the core, wash it with water, and eat it. He pulled out a whole root plant and cut it in half. Inside it, the core, the central point of demon energy, was embedded like a black seed. Darien cut out the core and washed it thoroughly with water. Try it. The white fleshy root was chewed hard in my mouth. There was a sweet taste at the tip of my wet tongue. Although it tasted dull compared to meat or tree fruits, it felt rich in nutrition. Certainly human knowledge is useful to me. That was something that only Darien could teach Helmut at the moment. Helmut went down to the water's edge carrying the water jar as Darien had instructed, and the sound of heavy footsteps approached. What are you doing? Olaga looked at Helmut with somewhat dissatisfied eyes and tilted her head. I'm going. See you later. Helmut, carrying a water jar, waved his hand. Olaga watched the boy leaving blankly. After a while, Olaga let out a dissatisfied sigh. The leopard glanced sideways in the direction the boy had left, as if he had some lingering regret, and eventually wandered away from the spot. Cold water was poured over my body. My mind, which had been in a daze, suddenly woke up. Darien was watching him with his arms crossed. Straighten your back. For several hours now, Helmut had been maintaining the so-called horseback riding posture, with his legs bent and his arms raised in front of him. My limbs were shaking and convulsing and my whole body was drenched in sweat. Hold that position for another ten minutes. Darien spoke mercilessly and sat down on a chair. Helmut gritted his teeth. It was too much training for a ten-year-old child. But Darien made Helmut follow him with just one word. Don't you want to go out to the forest? It was an effective threat. Darien made him do all kinds of difficult and strange things in the name of training. I think I'm going to die. Helmut had never received training like this before. He is only ten years old. It's natural that it's difficult, but still, I can hold on. Helmut endured to the end. If patience is a talent, Helmut was a genius. Having lived in a harsh environment since he was a baby, Pa's forest has helped him endure many things from the beginning. Helmut, who grew up in the forest and was naturally trained by traveling around, was agile in his movements and had a strong body. It may be thanks to Alaga's protection and the sprouts of darkness, but it must also have been thanks to his natural muscles that he has survived so far. He also had grit. There was something unbreakable in his pitch black eyes. That is absolutely not something an ordinary boy can have. A crude iron pot was placed over a burning fire in the yard. A thick liquid was bubbling inside. The moment I smelled that scent, my stomach growled. It was a mouth-watering smell that surprisingly stimulated hunger. Both cheeks tingled. Helmut felt saliva gathering in his mouth and moistened his lips with his tongue. Have you ever felt this crazy hunger? Eat. It's impossible to find proper dishes here in Pa's forest. Darien poured the contents into a bowl made from hard fruit peel. He called the brownish, thick liquid soup. I quickly brought it to my mouth and burned my tongue. Darien handed a spoon carved out of wood to Helmut, who was frowning and cooling his tongue. Helmut blinked. A shiver ran through him. It felt like my first time eating something this delicious. Is human food really like this? How did you make it? This, it's cooked well with mashed meat and the roots from yesterday. If you camp often, you get used to cooking. Even mediocre ingredients can become quite edible if you cook them well. I will teach you little by little. Helmut, intrigued by those words, looked at Darien. If I go out into the human world, I'll be able to eat food more delicious than this, right? I definitely have to go out to the forest of Paw. There was a solemn determination in his pitch-black eyes. Of course, it is natural that arduous training followed after that. It started as slow as a slug crawling, but then sped up like a lightning strike. One flow that runs through all the movements. After several days of training, Helmut's movements became similar to Darien's. But can Helmut do the same? The answer came quickly. No. Understanding. It was a firm word. It's no use just imitating. Understanding of the body. Furthermore, understanding of the mind. In other words, understanding of the sword. Let your sword go beyond your body and into your spirit. When it comes to swinging a sword, your fingertips, your muscles, and even the smallest details must be completely yours. You must penetrate and understand all the flows. Darien's words continued without interruption. 
When you feel like you control your sword like you control your own body, you can say you have finally mastered it. Those who swing their swords without thinking ultimately only rely on their trained bodies. Those guys can't escape their limits. You can be top-notch, but you can't be any better than that. Darian's first-class standards were extremely high, but Darian was a swordsman who went beyond that level. Helmut is being taught by a swordsman that every young boy learning the sword would want to be taught. Darian's standards are bound to be extremely high. Darian accepted Helmut not out of boredom or sympathy. There is no need for generosity in teaching swordsmanship. People only become useful when they are pushed and pushed hard. Moreover, in order to receive the sword from the sword saint, one had to endure such hardships. Darian was an example for him to follow. Helmut instinctively knew that. Training continued the next day and the day after that. Helmut's schedule strictly followed Darian's wishes. For the most part, it boiled down to simply eating, sleeping, training, and learning. I wake up in the morning, fill my water jar, eat, and then start my daily routine. The pattern of training changed frequently. Some days I would repeat one posture over and over again, while other days I would learn about the human body in vital points and practice with my body how to subdue an opponent. One day, he took on a wooden sword and fought Darien with his bare hands. It was too one-sided to call it a sparring match, because I was beaten unilaterally. Your movements are hasty and sloppy. There are many times when an effective attack is just a single needle away. The balance of your body, the strength of your opponent and yourself, muscle movement, and speed. You have to look through it all and make the optimal decision. Judgment should not be slow or wrong. If you can judge properly, you will be able to fight and win against enemies stronger than you. What you're doing with me is just sparring, so it's okay to make mistakes in judgment. But when you face the enemy, if you make a wrong decision, your life will be over. After 15 days of living with Darien, Helmut gained his freedom. Sometimes you need to take a break to increase the efficiency of your training. Don't train separately and rest. Darien emptied the cabin in the morning and headed somewhere. Helmut, who had slept well for the first time in a long time, left the hut at noon, wheezing. It's good not to train, but I feel somewhat empty. His eyes fell on the wooden sword, but it soon caught his attention. Today was a day off. As I came down to the water, a leopard wandered out of nowhere and started talking to me. Ilaga, hello. Helmut waved his hand. He didn't think it was a breakup since his territory was nearby. You seem to have grown taller. Do I? It's the growth period, Helmut replied, running his hand through his hair. He had been training regularly, following a routine of exercise, meals, and sleep, which seemed to contribute to his growth. His once chubby face, which was merely cute before, now appeared more handsome as he shed his baby fat. Although these changes were subtle, Ella noticed. Ella snickered. Well, he's just as tall as an acorn. He'll grow taller. I heard Darian owes a debt to Ella. Is that human's name Darian? What happened between Darian and Ella? They didn't seem to be on friendly terms, considering Ella didn't even know his name. Ella said firmly, I allowed him to live here. When he settled near my territory, I could have driven him away. But I talked to him and decided to leave him alone. That's why he could stay here. You didn't have any intention to fight. Whack. A sharp question made Ella's thick tail slap Helmut's head. I am Ella. I have no reason to avoid a fight with anyone, no matter who they are. Ella shouted, then suddenly sounded hesitant. Well, maybe I do. If I fought him and got injured, others might target me, right? Why should I do something like that for no reason? Of course, if he had caused trouble or made noise here, I would have driven him away. But when I approached him, he asked for permission to live here, so I talked to him and let him stay. The Nasty Snake Are you talking about Nahar? Nahar was a creature living in the eastern part of the Pahi Forest, just like Ella. In this forest, creatures like Nahar and Ella occupied the top of the food chain. Nahar wanted to devour him. However, that guy hesitated to fight Nahar. I expected him to destroy Nahar's nasty hobby when he appeared, but he gave up halfway. All right, I'll show you. Ella looked determined. Her thick tail wrapped around Helmut's body, and they leaped forward. The distance was tremendous. With each leap, Ella's massive body seemed to slice through the air. Helmut had to endure a strenuous time, reminiscent of the training sessions. Ella stopped abruptly. Helmut was pale and felt nauseous, covering his mouth. I'll show you. Ella crouched down, and Helmut followed suit, lowering his body. Below them, they could see huts nestled among the trees. Dozens of huts, similar to Darien's dwelling, were densely packed and there were living creatures moving around down there. Yes, they were humans. Helmut's eyes widened. It was unfamiliar. They wore clothes thinner than leather and carried buckets on their heads or something else. They were creatures classified as women, like his mother. Humans of the same species but different, females. Is this? Yes, that's the human farm. Helmut shook his head in confusion. 
the term human farm didn't make sense. A farm was a place where humans grew crops or raised animals. If it was a group of humans living together, it should be called a village. Why is it called a farm? Just watch. A thin man who had been moving chunks of wood stumbled. He looked weaker than the rabbit creature Helmut had caught earlier. In this forest, one could never survive alone. Because he can't do his job properly, Ella explained. Helmut remained silent, observing the rigid and harsh atmosphere. The door of the nearby building opened, and delicate, clean-looking humans poured out. Helmut realized they were females, a classification he had just learned. Helmut is a man. Darian, the first human he saw in the power forest, is also a man. The women, who were fair-skinned and curvy with delicate bone structures, seemed a bit strange to him. They were treated differently from the small men who appeared to be laborers at first glance. But none of them looked healthy. They had pale and fearful expressions on their faces. Some burly men moved them to a different building as if herding sheep, closing the doors firmly and putting up barriers. Is there any woman you like? Bella asked, her voice trembling. Like? I don't even know them, Helmut replied. If he had to describe his feelings, they looked different, maybe unique. But those fair-skinned and delicate women didn't seem to be doing any work at all. It was as if they were the ruling class of humans. These women are offerings. Offerings? Naho prefers human females with tender flesh and good digestion. Those females with white and delicate skin, soft bodies without muscles are offered to Naho. If they are too small, there won't be enough to eat, so they are raised separately and taken care of until they mature. The women who will be offered are kept like that. These women are then. They are livestock raised in the Pater Forest. They live freely in the forest, only to be devoured by Naho before they reach adulthood. He enjoys the fear and pain of his prey and slowly pushes them into his mouth. Such a perverted creature, Naho protects this village, and in return, he receives these women as offerings. That's right, but the one maintaining it is a human. There is a human who rules this village. All those humans there are Naho's livestock and that human is Naho's representative. Men maintain the village through labor, and they reward the most faithful ones with women for mating. They maintain a certain number that way. So that's why it's called a farm. Exactly. The terrified woman's chin was lifted by the old man, who looked at her with a satisfied expression. Ah, the woman's scream reached them, sending shivers down their spines. The trembling woman was dragged away by the men, her mouth gagged. If he had turned out to be unlucky and landed in Naho's territory, he would have become livestock on this farm. Why did Ella raise me then? If she found it troublesome to take care of me, she could have just left me in that village. Just as they were about to leave the territory. Oh, who is this? Helmut, who didn't sense anything, widened his eyes. A suffocating magical pressure pressed down on him. Yet there was no sound. It was eerie. Ella, who had stopped moving, firmly placed Helmut behind her. The misty ash-colored fog around the giant body became apparent. A tangible form of magic. His yellow eyes flashed like sulfur. He had two pairs of eyes. The two pairs of eyes glided through the air as if slipping away, creating an eerie, dreamlike scene. As they got closer, the mist around Naho's giant body faded away. Helmut held his breath. His heart felt crushed. Without hiding her claws, Ella also showed her fangs, releasing an aura of magic that could suffocate. Who are you trying to intimidate with that hideous head of yours? Are you trying to fight? Ella provocatively revealed her fangs to Naho who seemed to ignore her completely, emitting terrifying magic. Are you planning to steal a human from my village? Who said anything about stealing? This kid didn't come from your farm, you know. But, this smell. So this child is Darian's. Is it impossible for humans to have children on their own? He's not Darian's child. Is he associated with him? He just stole clothes from Darian's house, that's all. There's no connection. Luckily, there was no master-apprentice relationship in the monster world. Naho had no interest in human ecology. To him, humans were nothing more than food worth nurturing. Naho, with his narrowed eyes, tilted his head as if he had seen something unusual. The corners of the snake's mouth curled into a smile as if he was trying to be hospitable, but it still looked menacing. Ella also lowered her stance slightly. Despite her confident demeanor, she was dealing with a formidable opponent. Naho slipped away as if he was sliding down. As distance grew between them, his snake-covered body disappeared into the mist once more. Only his eerie, glowing eyes emitted light from the fog. His once friendly tone turned chilly, as if he had never been kind. The two snake eyes flickered coldly. Naho was notorious for his ferocity and cruelty. Usually, the creatures that dominated their territories didn't mind others as long as they acknowledged their authority. They would tolerate intruders as long as they respected their rule. But Naho was different. If any creature dared to set foot in his territory, he would chase them down and devour them whole. 
absorbing both their flesh and magical essence. He was a greedy predator. That's why Naho let Ella go. She was strong enough to be spared. His claws and fangs were sharp, his movements swift. He was an opponent who couldn't be crushed or swallowed whole. As long as Ella didn't initiate a fight, it was wise to avoid a confrontation. Confirming Naho's retreat, Ella gently nudged Helmet with her tail. Helmet, who had been lying on the ground, was still attached to her tail and was carried away effortlessly. Once they reached Darian's house, Ella let Helmet down. Can I become as strong as Darian? The abrupt question made Ella snort. Ella, too, became unexpectedly serious. Ordinary humans could never become like Darian. To surpass the boundaries of humanity required something beyond effort. Helmet frowned. So, does that mean I can't do it? Perhaps Helmet had that something. After all, the darkness gave him power that wasn't human. Was Ella hoping that Helmet, the exception who escaped the forest, would become stronger? Helmet couldn't tell. He might feel lonely if he leaves. However, the forest belonged to the creatures of magic. Even with the power of the darkness, it wasn't an environment suitable for humans to live in. Helmet returned to the hut. Darian, who seemed to have arrived around the same time, had just finished unloading the luggage from his shoulders. It seems you've been wandering around with that leopard. Darian clicked his tongue. Perfect timing. I need to process this. What is this? It's a poison. A poison? Why? You need to consume a small amount every day. Helmut ate Matso every night and writhed in pain every night. But the pain weakened gradually, and the duration of its appearance shortened. After a few days, the effect became noticeable. When he woke up, his head felt light and clear. Learning accelerated, and his body, now with well-developed muscles, became more agile. Darian taught Helmut a few more basic moves. Horizontal cut, vertical cut, and diagonal cut. His perspective had changed strangely. Should we say that the path of the sword became clearer in his eyes? It was different from improved eyesight. Is it better concentration? Clarity of mind improved due to Matzo's influence. Concentration became stronger day by day. He felt like the sword was glued to his palm. You have learned to enjoy the sword. Yes, this was what joy felt like. It wasn't just about mastering it to become stronger. It was the thrill of the moment when the sword was swung. The immersion felt when becoming one with the sword brought a sense of pleasure akin to the world brightening up. It was the first time something had engulfed him so thoroughly. Fortunately, Darian was relieved. Diligence alone was not enough. To become the best in a field, one must find joy in it. For several months, Helmet wielded the sword countless times. One day, while practicing basic moves and conditioning his body, Darian finally spoke to him. Do you remember what I said about Vise? Yes, Vise is a formless power, much like the magic of demons. I've always felt that. The darkness in your heart is a formless power, different only in its attributes. Vise is an intangible force, but if it is not based on a strong physique and technique, it doesn't hold much significance. A swordsman channels the energy of the atmosphere through the sword into Vise. Your body is now ready to absorb vise. What I'm going to teach you is a vise cultivation method known to be the most effective on the continent. Now, follow my instructions. Swing the sword and breathe, assimilating the energy mixed in the air into your body. That energy is vise. Your task is to freely manipulate this power and manifest it through the sword. Darian stood with a wooden sword in his hand. Just by his posture, the wooden sword he held appeared as solid as an iron sword. When Darian began to move, Helmut forgot to breathe and stared at him. Helmut could now imitate the movement perfectly. Darian was also surprisingly fast. He stopped after a while, a feeling of completing a perfect circle and returning to his original position. Helmut noticed that Darian intentionally performed the movement slowly. It was not an easy task. He had to synchronize his breathing, speed, and flow, not just swinging the sword. But Darian didn't go easy on him. Do it properly. If Helmut made even the slightest mistake, Darian's thunderous shouts and fists flew like lightning. In the past, Helmut hadn't understood why Darian had become so aggressive. He had never shown such intense force before. But Helmut noticed his movements this time. They were remarkable and impressive. The desire to achieve what Darian had done moved Helmut. He's truly strong. Darian stood on a distant and elevated place, so far away and high up that he seemed unreachable. Helmut understood why Alaga couldn't answer the question about becoming as strong as Darian. Time was on Helmut's side. When his head felt as if it would explode, Helmut could learn and improve. About a month had passed, and Helmut could perfectly replicate the movement Darian had shown him. Darian also moved at an astonishing speed. He immediately issued the next task. The way you grip the sword is where swordsmanship starts for you. Humans learn swordsmanship. 
which is similar to the hunting techniques of beasts. It involves swinging the sword, defeating enemies, and claiming victory. Helmut listened intently to the torrent of words. Although not talkative by nature, Darian, now having captured him, poured out a storm of lectures. Darian hated explaining things twice. If he thought Helma didn't understand properly, he struck him. He believed violence was the best way. His concentration improved day by day. It wasn't just when he swung the sword, even during lectures, he remained focused. Vyas didn't directly influence intellect. But as Vyas accumulated, the influence of the Seed of Darkness in him grew stronger. As awareness developed, his memory and learning abilities improved. Helmut managed to avoid Darian's violent scolding by understanding his teachings properly. And four years passed. Time flowed like an arrow. Fourteen-year-old Helmut appeared to be around sixteen due to his tall stature and physique. He wasn't naturally tall, but his regular lifestyle and training had influenced him. Despite his lanky appearance, his body was well-toned with muscles. His clothes, crafted to fit his form, were generously sized. In the sun-deprived forest of Pahal, his pale face contrasted with his jet-black eyes, which held a strange light, deep and perceptive. After washing up and wearing clean clothes, his hidden features came to life. His refined and graceful facial features exuded nobility. With a straight posture, he looked dignified and proper. If he wore his clothes properly, he would seem like a nobleman. Witnessing his growth, even the unapproachable Darian felt a swelling in his chest. When they first met, Darian had mentioned being 66 years old, so now he must be around 100. As a powerful swordsman, he didn't look like an elderly man due to his vigorous aura. But lately, he seemed to be losing his strength, gradually starting to show his age. You've become somewhat usable. Still a long way to go, though. Darian said gruffly, pretending to be unimpressed. More importantly, show me your vise. Helmut raised his hand, which had been resting on the ground. The tip of his wooden sword shot up into the air. While staying in that position, Helmut focused his mind. A faint light shone along the edge of the sword, shaping vise at the age of 14. It had been about a year since Helmut could shape Vyas. Among the few swordsmen who could shape Vyas in their teens, most had become renowned swordsmen on the continent. Helmut was just 14. It was an area not explained by mere talent. The Seed of Darkness is a terrifying power. Darian watched Helmut's achievement with thoughtful eyes. The Seed of Darkness was said to be a fragment of the fallen demon king scattered in the world. If the demon king were to resurrect from that body, the world would have to face destruction and fight again. That's why since he first met Helmut, Darian had been tormented by such thoughts. But I did take him as my disciple. If Helmut had gone berserk even once during his intense training, Darian might not have killed him but would have given up on him. The seed of darkness could be ferocious. If a young boy brimming with vitality gained strength, he would be even more susceptible to its influence. But Helmut seemed to manage the influence of the seed of darkness well, thanks to his calm disposition. Darian stared at the tip of Helmut's sword with heavy eyes. The emerging vise was a murky gray. The vise Helmut first shaped was purer than this. His vise was originally a pale white. It turned ashen as time passed. The seed of darkness is affecting him. No matter how careful he was about his diet and refused to accept magic, this was the forest of Pahal. There was no way to completely stop the growth of the Seed of Darkness in this magic-filled forest. The Seed of Darkness was slowly growing within the depths of Helmut's heart. Can I guarantee that he won't be consumed by it someday? Darian couldn't answer that question. But even if he becomes a threat to the world, what does it matter to me? After all, everything would happen after he died. Since being betrayed and thrown into the forest of Pahal, Darian's fate was to end his life here. He knew there was a way out, but he chose to give up early. I thought I had more time, but it seems the end is approaching. Darian hurried. By harshly guiding and pushing Helmut, he tried to integrate his knowledge and experience. The result was successful. Helmut not only mastered Darian's swordsmanship but also became more human-like than when they first met. A child raised in the wild could now imitate human behavior. He had been taught common sense about the human world, so he should be able to adapt reasonably well outside. Although leaving the forest of Pahal posed a problem, with the help of the leopard Alaga, they could manage. Everything afterward would be left to fate. The way out is simple. Beyond the southern part of the forest of Pahi, there lies the human world. To get there, you must naturally cross the sacred barrier. There's a specific place where the sacred barrier weakens. In theory, you can cross over to the human world through that place. If there are humans who can withstand the sacred barrier and reach there, even if they possess a bud of darkness or not, they can go. There were several limitations. However, Helmut realized that he met the conditions quite well. He had a bud of darkness, but its size was small. 
With his bis protection, he could withstand the weakened sacred barrier to some extent. Reaching there was the challenge, though. I don't know that place. I never intended to leave, so I never tried to find out. Someone knows that place. It's the territory of a monster with two snake heads. The chief of the human village there, Iruko, knows the way. That leopard knows where it is. Iruko, a name he had heard before. So, it was him. Helmut nodded. Iruko is a magician, but not an exceptional one. However, do not let your guard down. He has many subordinates, so infiltrate the village and wait for an opportunity. It's winter, so the monster with the snake heads might be in hibernation. But if Iruko calls him, he'll appear. Darian stated firmly. Remember, you cannot defeat him. Four years ago, Helmut had witnessed the brutality of Naho with his own eyes. As he recalled, every cell in his body shuddered. When you leave the forest, you will face numerous challenges in the human world. It will be fascinating for you, who has only lived in the forest. Perhaps you'll encounter only enjoyable events without much difficulty. However, tragedy always strikes silently. It hides in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity to grab your ankle and pull you into the abyss. Be vigilant, for it's not something you can avoid by being careful, nor can you evade it by running away. You will experience helplessness and pain. Do not lose yourself. Do you understand? Helmut furrowed his brows. He didn't comprehend the situations Darian was talking about. The darkness lurking within Helmut. It was dormant now, but its essence was a greedy and malevolent force. When reason blurred and he lost his self, that darkness would seize the opportunity to consume Helmut. Your body may be as sturdy as a rock, but even the strongest rock crumbles under internal flaws. It won't be easy. But humans, even if they crumble, have the ability to stand up again if they don't lose themselves. With those words, silence fell. Helmut furrowed his brows and pondered what Darian meant. Ella dropped something in front of Helmut. What's this? Suspiciously, Helmut looked at the ragged piece of cloth covered in dirt. It was worn and dirty, but the texture in his hands felt surprisingly soft, as if it would melt like snow. As he rummaged through it, a round object with thin golden chains rolled out. Helmut stared intently at the object shaking in front of him. It was a pendant engraved with patterns resembling vines on the surface. Helmut and Ella didn't know what it was used for. Ella pretended she knew. After examining it for a moment, Helmut found that the pendant could be opened. With a small sound, the pendant opened like a shell. There's something written inside. Helmut, who had learned to read from Darien, tried to read the inscription. May your path be filled with light, Margaret Elaine. It must be my mother's. It must have been something made for a newborn baby, a blessing for a new life. A vague sense of emotion washed over him. Helmut fumbled with the pendant and put it around his neck, tucking it inside his clothes. The human farm will probably be heavily guarded. I can't watch your back. If I enter the territory, Naho will notice. Don't worry, I can handle it alone. Helmut instinctively knew how to gauge the strength of his opponents, almost as if he had become a monster himself. Among those who lived comfortably within Naho's fence, there were no strong individuals. As long as I don't let my guard down, I can do it. Helmut stated firmly, I'm ready. El Arugo, before his exile to the forest of Paraths, was a wicked sorcerer who horrified the world. El Arugo possessed something special besides his magical talent. The fact that he was not born with morals and conscience. Among the many sorcerers, he thought that to become stronger, he had to take a path not chosen by others. For example, a path that pursued forbidden or dark powers. A path that pursued stronger magic, stronger sorcery. Sorcerers, captivated by desires, sometimes crossed the line that should not be crossed. Initially, he bought enslaved people, tortured them, and used them as materials. That work suited El Arugo's disposition quite well, unsurprisingly. The pleasure he derived from torturing those who howled in pain and fear. That feeling gradually intoxicated him. The rapidly increasing dark magical power awakened his true nature. El Arugo became more and more daring and cruel. He personally went down to the village, kidnapped people, tortured them in every way imaginable, and killed them in such a way that the hostages begged for death. The cycle gradually narrowed, and his reckless use of dark magic left traces. Irugo, who settled in Naho's territory, tracked down the humans who had fallen into the forest of Pa and gathered them up at random. In order to avoid being eaten by monsters right away, they had no choice but to follow Irugo. Human Farm Irugo was a shepherd and king here, the only human population in the forest of Pa. This is the castle he built, and the humans are a flock of sheep. As long as the sacrifice was properly offered, Naho did not interfere with human farms. Lucky me, Helmut thought. Monster attacks were more frequent than he had anticipated. Despite the strict boundaries of the village, Helmut's infiltration, unlike the monsters, had been smooth. Surrounded by bustling magical energy, 
Helmut hid his presence, keeping a close eye on the direction where Yugo was, waiting for the moment when Yugo moved alone. He didn't have to wait long. Yugo moved according to Helmut's plan, leaving his protected sanctuary and entering the laboratory. In that moment of relaxation, Helmut struck. Just one moment was enough. I didn't expect an opportunity to come this quickly. But it wasn't over yet. Not until he achieved his goal and escaped Nahuo's territory. With a sword pointed at his back, Ryugo calmly moved deeper into the laboratory. What's your name? Ryugo inquired. Helmut had heard that Ryugo was sly and eloquent. He had no intention of being deceived by idle talk. I don't know, Helmut replied. Well, fine. But let me offer you a piece of advice. The way out is just a theory. It's an untested theory that might cost you your life. Are you willing to risk your young life on a theory that might be futile? No one has ever attempted it. Of course, there weren't many who had the ability to try. Darian might be able to do it, but he chose not to. Considering your presence here, what happened to Darian? Did you decide to go together? For the first time, Helmut showed signs of hesitation in his eyes. Oh, I see. Darian must be dead. It was a sudden realization. Darian's disciple. He seemed skilled, but he was still young. If Darian had infiltrated with him, it might have been better. If he had Darian as an opponent, Ayugo would have surrendered without resistance. Ayugo could also infiltrate here while Darian was in his deep sleep. Sending the disciple he had raised into danger alone seemed excessive. Darian, the only human in the forest that Ayugo could not control. I've been waiting for this moment, Ayugo realized. This was Nahuo's territory, the heart of the forest. Nahuo was a formidable opponent, even for Darian. It might have been difficult for Darian to accept a battle with Nahuo as his life dwindled away. Darian needed time to train his disciple. That's why the responsibility of extracting the records fell to his disciple. Ryugo sneered inwardly. The greatest threat was completely eliminated. With a repentant smile, Ryugo extended his hand. Well, well, there's no need to be so vigilant. Let me make you a proposal. In Ryugo's hand, a thin booklet appeared. Helmut's eyes moved toward the booklet. If you, Darian's disciple, inherit this village, how about living here? Nonsense. Helmut furrowed his brow. He was incredulous. Ryugo spread his arms. You're more than qualified as someone who learned Darian's swordsmanship. The people here have become weak. Useless. They have no value. I'll hand over this place to you. All the women here will be yours. Not only the women but everything. Nahua will confirm it for me. Think carefully. But Helmut rejected him outright. He held his sword to Ayugo's throat. I don't need anything you offer. A mocking smile appeared on Ayugo's face. Are you willing to risk your life for a futile hope? I will find a way out and survive, Helmut said with conviction. Snap. He struck Ayugo down to the ground. What are you doing? A rattling voice echoed. Helmut bound Ayugo's hands and firmly tied him to a pillar. Helmut knew that merely binding a magician wouldn't be enough. Helmut raised his magical energy and pricked a few points on Ayugo's body with his fingers. For a few hours, he prevented Ayugo from using magic by blocking the magical pathways. To call Nahuo in his deep sleep, he needed magic. For the next few hours, Ayugo was just an ordinary old man. It will wear off over time. Live a good life from now on. He left Ayugo, bewildered, behind. What are you thinking? Do you really think you can escape the forest alive? Ayugo shouted desperately. He wasn't afraid to take risks. If he believed it was possible, Ayugo would have tried it himself. Driven by anger, jealousy, and intensified emotions, the sealed magic forced its way out of his body against his will. His veins twisted, and blood vessels bulged on his face. While letting out a painful groan, he finally called out to his master, his owner, who had fallen into deep slumber deep in the earth. Lord Nahar, please wake up. The ruler of this domain, the snake with two heads, was forcibly awakened. A tremendous anger accompanied by a terrifying magic was transmitted. Anxious cries resonated loudly. Rejoice, Darian has died, and his disciple is here. Nahar burst into laughter sharply. His booming voice hinted at his exhilarated mood. The giant snake began to move with a threatening magical aura. There are no freebies in this world. With a splatter, Ergo vomited blood. He laughed wickedly. The price of taking the records would be paid with his life. Helmet was running. As he left Ergo's lair, his legs moved faster, skimming the ground. A ominous premonition covered him like a black cloud. With screams, monsters rushed past him in a mad frenzy, leaping over his head. They weren't trying to attack him, they were fleeing in terror. It meant one thing. Nahar had awakened from his deep slumber. I should have killed him as I planned. Helmut's gaze turned cold. But it was too late for regrets. Escaping from this place was urgent now. No matter how fast his movements were, waking up from deep slumber meant his body would be sluggish. Running was the only option now. 
instinct raised every hair on his body, making his skin prickle with tension. Death was close. Something was approaching from deep within the forest, shrouded in dense magic. The origin of the magic was impossible to discern. Rumbling echoed from a distance. The vibrations shook the ground beneath him, rapidly closing the gap. Howling winds accompanied the dense ash-colored fog that approached like a falling meteor. His body felt like it was burning up, despite the cold. The ashy fog revealed something approaching. Bright eyes, like sulfuric flames, floated eerily in the mist. The fog was so thick that it felt suffocating. Helmut's gaze turned around instinctively. The sound of scales scraping against the ground was faint but distinct. Nara's two heads emerged from the fog. He couldn't pierce Naho's sturdy black body. Even with his previous attack, he had consumed a considerable amount of bis. Damn it, you idiotic head. Crunch. Following a terrible noise, there was a squelching sound as the tough and thick flesh was being chewed. Helmet, who was running, suddenly looked back. One of Naho's heads was swallowing the head that had lost its eyes. It was a grotesque and horrifying sight. The head that had become the only one of Naho's heads attacked its defenseless counterpart through its throat. Crimson blood and magic shot out from the severed section. The wounds were healing rapidly. Useless parts have been taken care of now. Naho's eyes turned towards Helmet. Glowing with venom and anger, its eyes were fierce. Naho was now a snake with only one head. A single-minded killing machine. I will devour you and melt you inside my stomach along with my head. Like an enraged serpent, it flew towards him. It was as fast as if it had thousands of legs. The distance that Helmet had opened up was closed in an instant. Thud. The tremendous impact was as if colliding with a rock, rendering him senseless. Helmet flew through the air like a ragdoll. He barely managed to keep hold of his sword. He spat out blood that had pooled in his mouth. His head was spinning. Thanks to the instinctively raised bis, his body was protected. Otherwise, he would have died. The creature was nearby. Helmut only moved his head to scan for its position. Naho's shadow loomed over him, and he found it instantly. It was a short distance of about 50 steps away. The area around Naho was already reduced to ruins. If it had been the original Naho, it would have spotted him immediately. However, after losing one head, something seemed off. The creature shook its head from side to side, staggering. Its senses must be messed up. Adapting to a single head after living with two for so long would take time. In the meantime, I have to escape. Waves of magic roared like a gale. The wicked snake grinned sharply. With vibrations, the snake moved. It crawled on the ground, its speed as fast as a rushing wave, dragging itself forward. An absolute death was approaching. Helmut's eyes widened. A massive object fell, blocking his view. He stared at the back of a newly appeared white leopard. Ella, a rough voice mixed with heavy breathing could be heard. Helmut looked at the snowy white leopard's back as if a miracle had happened. Thank you for your help. He didn't know if he would ever see her again. Ella had been with him for a long time. A warm current spread through his chest. The ongoing battle between the two magical beings continued, shaking the air with its turbulent waves. The natural instinctive fear provoked by the aftermath of the battle made the magical creatures around them gasp for breath. The further away from Ella's domain he got, the more weary Helmut became. It was a situation he had anticipated, but he couldn't afford to rest easy with the demonic creatures relentlessly chasing him. He couldn't sleep peacefully, constantly on edge even when drinking water from the stream. In the depths of Faha Forest, Helmut truly realized what it meant to be human. He realized just how lucky he was to have survived. There were no monsters in Ella's domain that would dare to attack Helmut, except for the ones he had fought. But outside of Ella's domain, Helmut was just a vulnerable human, appearing small and weak, as if he could be swallowed in one bite. In the eyes of the creatures in Faha Forest, humans were nothing more than prey. The scent of powerful demons lingered in the air, but it was not a familiar smell. Those who couldn't resist their hunger rushed at Helmut relentlessly, regardless of their strength. Food supply, however, was relatively easy to manage. I can handle anyone as long as they're not as strong as Naho. The magic he vaguely sensed became almost non-existent as he approached the barrier. The air without magic felt unfamiliar yet refreshing to Helmut. Not bad. Ella would probably dislike it. Water sound. Helmut followed the sound almost instinctively. The rushing sound was not from a gentle stream but a vigorous flow of water. Helmut followed the sound eagerly. It grew louder and he saw a vast gorge before him. A wide stream flowed down the slope. It seemed like all the water in Faha Forest was gathered here. And at the end of the rushing stream, a hazy sky appeared. A sense of pure joy pierced his heart. How long had he waited for this moment? The hardships he had endured to get here flashed before his eyes like a slideshow. Helmut kept his distance and peered into the water. He couldn't be sure that there were no monsters living near the barrier, so he checked just in case. 
Suddenly, his vision darkened. Had night fallen so suddenly? No, a shadow covered everything, as if the moon were blocking the sun. A gigantic bird. As it spread its wings and descended, the wind from its flapping wings shook the water's surface like a gale. The giant bird landed gracefully, defying gravity with its elegant and light movements. Its fur, radiant like a rainbow, stood out against its vibrant feathers. Magic emanated from the bird when it folded its wings. One thing was certain, it wasn't an ordinary creature. Despite its feigned kindness, Helmut remained vigilant. Naho's tone was friendly, too. Most monsters saw humans as nothing more than prey. He racked his memory. In the south, there's a guy named Igrol. He looks magnificent. He's a bird with colorful feathers. You'll know. This place couldn't be Igrol's habitat. It must have been curiosity about the boundary that brought him around here. However, he didn't seem insane enough to directly throw himself into the barrier. Igrol flapped his wings. A sarcastic voice accompanied by a sneer filled the air. Do you think that's possible? You weak human child. Even the core of your magic inside you is visible to my eyes. You're no different from a monster. You won't be able to cross the barrier and will end up dead. I am the only human here who has come this far to cross the sacred barrier. A person equipped with both abilities and determination. Leave the weak human prey to burn in the barrier. What a waste. There are plenty of humans in the forest of Pahi. But I am the only one who can cross the barrier. Igril seemed to contemplate for a moment, tilting his head. Helmut waited for a response, tension in the air. Monsters were capricious, but Igril wouldn't change his words or launch a surprise attack against Helmut. There was no need for a strong one to do such a thing against the weak. Igril's reply came, fine, bold child. As you say, I am curious too. There might be no other human willing to attempt this risking their life, and I don't want to miss that chance. The first human to leave the forest of Pahi. I'll be the first monster to witness that. Let's go. However, Helmut said, Determination shone in his eyes. Dark as the abyss, yet those eyes held a sharpness and firmness as if piercing through the sky. Helmut leaped into the water. The flowing water was as cold as ice. The powerful current woke him up sharply, making his mind clear. Without needing to swim, Helmut was swept away by the current. He felt Igril's magic reaching out from behind. The magic extended from Igril enveloped Helmut. As strange magic flowed around his body, Helmut's body shivered. He almost pulled out his dagger, thinking he might brush it off. However, it seemed like Igril was planning to follow the plan. The magic flowing from Igril felt alien, and it made his body twitch. It felt like it would tear him apart from the inside out. Helmut felt the gathered magic deep within his belly. Helmut was hit by an unprecedented pain. It was a torment that would make him confess to anything. The heat, as if molten iron pillars pierced through him from his head to his body, was unbearable. Helmut felt like he had died and been reborn thousands of times in that short period. The barrier rejected impurity. The power of purification burned Helmut's skin inside and out. Helmut's magic was rapidly depleted as it protected his vital organs and tissues. The meager magic he had was like a flimsy wooden shield, rapidly dwindling and drying up. His will to resist was broken in an instant. It was impossible to maintain consciousness. Being carried away by the current, Helmut lost consciousness. He didn't know if he had succeeded in crossing the barrier. Finn, at the age of 14, was a member of the Faces Mercenary Corps, a small but reputable mercenary group. He was a grade 4 mercenary with exceptional skills, despite his young age, and had been serving the Faces Mercenary Corps since he was an orphan. I'll get better as I grow older, he used to say. But to improve, he needed experience. Finn found himself involved in this mission as a errand boy for the mercenary group. The Faces Mercenary Corps had received a large contract, leading to Finn's first mission. He was both nervous and unfamiliar with camping, making him uneasy about staying in the dense forest. Why do we have to rest in a place like this? Stop complaining and go fetch water. There's a stream over there in the valley, Tanya, a grade 3 mercenary with a silver emblem, said, pointing her finger. Come on, it's getting dark. His steps quickened. The forest felt eerie. The air was humid and uncomfortable. I need to get water quickly and return. Once they reached the gorge, Finn quickly plunged the water container into the stream. He felt like a water spirit might grab his head at any moment. A water spirit. Come to think of it, I saw something earlier. Finn absentmindedly raised his head. There, there's a body, a body over there. Help, someone save him. Even though he was a mercenary, Finn had only been running errands for the mercenary group. This was the first time he had seen a dead body. The body is here. That guy is just a coward. He probably mistook a piece of wood for a corpse. Let me check. Tanya stepped forward and grabbed Finn's shoulder. Where is the body? TH there. Step aside. You also need to find the water container you left behind. When Tanya spoke firmly, Finn, 
who had been on the verge of tears, hesitated but eventually moved forward. Yet, he felt less afraid with her by his side. As they approached the gorge, Finn pointed hesitantly. Over there. Is it here? At that moment, something caught Tanya's eye as she walked closer. Partially buried in the sand, swaying slightly from the water current, it looked like a piece of wood but had a human form. It was unmistakably a human body. Tanya's expression stiffened in alarm. A body in a place like this. Finding a body in such a deserted place was unsettling. Tanya cautiously approached the body. As she got closer, her eyes widened in surprise. Finn, come here quickly. Yes, he's still breathing. We need to pull him out. His consciousness had completely faded. The moment he regained consciousness, Helmut realized he was surrounded by strange noises. His blood ran cold. He opened his eyes wide and tried to sit up. Where am I? What happened to me? Helmut quickly moved his gaze. He was lying under a blanket, and a fire crackled nearby. People, had he ever seen such a sight before? Helmut felt a sense of deja vu but couldn't place it. He shuddered. Oh, are you awake? One of them noticed Helmut waking up and approached him. Hey, you're awake now, right? Shocked, Helmut stared back at the short-haired woman. She looked completely different from the women he had seen at the human farm. His first and last encounter. She seemed much taller than Helmut and appeared sturdy. I thought you were dead. Thankfully, you seemed to be fine. What happened to you? Helmut, still groggy, shook his head. His mind was a jumble of confusion. The woman seemed to accept that Helmut had lost most of his memories, judging by his limited knowledge. You seem to have amnesia. Did you hit your head hard? Helmut recalled Darian's advice. If you find it difficult to lie, just tell them you don't remember. It's common to lose memory after a head injury. His halting response unintentionally seemed genuine. Tanya, the woman, frowned. Really? That's inconvenient. Did you injure your head? Helmut nodded, feigning difficulty in speaking. Your name, what is it? Helmut, anything else you remember? I know how to use a sword, he said, choosing one of the limited truths. Tanya seemed to believe him, understanding that he had lost most of his memories except for a few basic skills. You know how to use a sword. That's fortunate. We need to focus on getting you better physically for now. Don't worry, I've got your back. I'll take care of you for a while. Helmut felt a mix of confusion and gratitude. Who's that? Is that the one? That guy? Is he really the same corpse-like guy from yesterday? Can someone change so drastically just by washing? Even if I wash a hundred times, I won't look like that. Did you not wipe yourself properly, you idiot? Is he a noble? Despite just having washed, Helmut's clean face shone brightly. His worn-out traveler's clothes felt shabby enough to make him look like a noble. Helmut quietly returned to his spot and checked his sword. Excuse me, are you a noble? The boy, who had been arguing earlier, asked politely. Helmut paused in the act of wiping his sword. Maybe, he was a noble. Darian had mentioned something like that. Nobles, the ruling class of humans. However, mercenaries were mostly commoners. Without any way to prove his status, it was meaningless. Helmut hesitated. I don't know. I don't remember. Does it matter what your status is? Right now, you're just our mercenary group's cook. Tanya, who had approached unnoticed, interrupted. She patted Helmut on the shoulder. What's your name? Tanya, how old are you? 24. Wow, you look younger than you are. Finn stared at Helmut with curious eyes, making Helmut seem fascinating to him. It was the first time Helmut had ever conversed with someone his age. His body is recovering well. It was when they went to the village doctor accompanied by Tanya. The doctor, who casually patted various places after undressing Helmut, said carelessly, Did you examine him properly? Hey, this girl, how dare you talk to me like that? I'll make medicine for you, so take care of it yourself. No, this boy lost consciousness until recently. He's practically a cripple. Take the medicine and get lost. Memories eventually come back. What am I supposed to do about that? The doctor retorted in annoyance and prepared a potion without much care. Tanya grabbed the pouch containing the potion, wearing an openly displeased expression. When she paid the fee, the doctor, in a brusque manner, said to Helmut, You have to take the medicine three times a day. Are you really okay? Pin said you were struggling to walk and whimpering. Helmut raised an eyebrow. It's not that bad. I was weak from lying down for so long. I'm fine now. Really? Well, I did see your grip. Your body seems to be well trained. You know how to wield a sword, right? You probably trained under a master. Properly, I assume. Tanya struck a nerve. Although his muscles had shrunk, the old calluses on his hands hadn't disappeared. They were marks left from wielding a sword countless times. Helmut nodded. Yes, when I held a sword, it felt familiar. In that case, how about a spar with me? A spar? With you? Don't worry about it. Think of it as a way to loosen up. The mercenary group was staying in an inn with a spacious courtyard. 
They would meet the client either tonight or tomorrow morning. All right. Helmut's eyes changed. His competitive spirit surged. Competing in strength was something he was familiar with almost as much as hunting. A match. That sounds interesting. How about doing it here? Several members of the face mercenary group gathered in the courtyard, diligently exercising their bodies. When Tanya appeared with Helmut, all eyes were on them. Tanya, are you going to spar with him? Yeah, yeah, so everyone, step aside and watch. It seems like we've got ourselves some good entertainment. They murmured and moved to the corners. Some sat down, propping their butts, while others became spectators, shouting loudly. Isn't he the guy whose bones would break if you just flicked him? Be gentle. We don't want to ruin that pretty face of his. Isn't his face prettier than Tanya's? Stop it. Tanya shouted threateningly, and they quieted down. In her hand, she held a thick wooden practice sword. Helmet also felt relieved. It was just a piece of wood. But if it was in the hands of a sword master, it became a weapon. The two faced each other. Tanya confidently said, There's only one rule. Fight until one of us falls to the ground. Attack with all your might. And strong, so don't hold back. Helmut adjusted his balance carefully, as he had always been taught. He had learned to take swordsmanship seriously. There was no room for carelessness or sloppiness. The voices of the mercenaries were almost inaudible due to their concentration, which had heightened to the utmost level. Helmut was aware of his physical condition. He couldn't use this, and he couldn't use his legs properly. If his physical strength didn't keep up, he had to fight by flowing with the situation instead of confronting it head-on. This tactic had become familiar to him when facing Darien. Why are you hesitating? Come on. Tanya's sharp voice pushed him, and finally, Helmut's sword moved. Even if it was just a piece of wood, once it was in the hands of a swordsman, it became a weapon. When he looked at Tanya's eyes, the movements of her bones and muscles were clearly captured in his mind. Left waist. He thrust the sword forward, aiming at her left waist. Tanya lightly parried the attack. Her strength is clearly superior to mine. This time, Tanya's attack began. She moved in swiftly, aiming her sword repeatedly at Helmut's head. Helmut watched carefully, dodging the strikes aimed at his head. He parried and lifted the sword, piercing her solar plexus. Tanya's arm muscles swelled tightly. The direction of the wooden sword, slashing down sharply, changed. Helmut tried to evade the attack, but his side was struck before he could react. Why can't I dodge? If he had moved a little faster, Tanya would have been the one to pay the price. But his legs didn't follow through. It felt like his entire body was shackled. He was as slow as a tortoise. The entire body felt like it was tied with chains. What should I do? However, Tanya didn't give him time to think. She rushed forward and continued her assault, her sword jabbing repeatedly. With her strength, her speed was proportional. Thud, thud. He managed to block the first two strikes, but his wrist became numb from the impact. The third strike accurately pierced his abdomen. Thud, Tanya tripped Helmut's stumbling legs. He fell backward, and Tanya lightly pressed the tip of her wooden sword against his throat. I lost. Tanya reached out and helped Helmut up. Her face was cheerful and friendly again, as if she was teasing him. From the look in your eyes, you seem upset. I was defeated one-sidedly. He retorted curtly and Helmut sighed. He was more frustrated with his body, which didn't obey his intentions. Compared to Darien, who was far stronger, this opponent seemed full of flaws. His swordsmanship wasn't perfectly efficient either. He knew how to counter it, but his body didn't follow. Or is Tanya stronger than I thought? He had been defeated by a grade 3 mercenary, not a grade 1 or 2. As Darien had said, the world of humans was not to be underestimated. Helmut was reminded of this fact once again. At that moment, someone approached and spoke. Tanya is recognized as a skilled mercenary even within our mercenary group. It's natural that you lost. Don't be too disappointed. With a solemn face and a considerably large build, he was a man with the same light brown eyes as Tanya. You passed. I passed. What kind of test was this? He hadn't heard anything about it. Tanya revealed a smile and gave him a thumbs-up gesture. You did well. Yes, you passed the entrance exam. You are now a member of the face mercenary unit. We didn't inform you because we were worried that it might burden Tanya. If you hadn't passed, we were just going to leave you in this village. We need to perform missions, and it's difficult to work together if you're not a member of the mercenary unit. Besides, we can't just accept anyone into the mercenary unit. Everyone was watching you from a distance. But, well, he didn't seem like a troublemaker, and young guys often crawl up to Tanya. So, when Tanya said she would test you, everyone agreed. My name is Payan. I am the only grade 2, Gold Badge Mercenary in the Face Mercenary Unit. Tanya is my younger sister. My name is Byrne. Grade 3 Silver Badge Mercenary. I'm Uter. I'm also Grade 3. Maros. Grade 3 Silver Badge. I'm Grade 4 Copper Badge. 
To be officially registered as a grade 4 mercenary, you have to go to the mercenary guild. But if you're recognized by our mercenary unit, it should be accepted elsewhere. So, let's prepare a mercenary certificate for you. The certificate he handed over was filled with detailed information about Helmut's physical characteristics. The skill guarantee was provided by the face mercenary unit. You don't need to write about your background. There's no need to reveal your identity unless you've been wanted for a significant crime. Even if you are a noble, you won't receive any special treatment. It's because it's rude to ask about each other's past among mercenaries. When you join the mercenary unit, how long do you have to stay? I might have to leave someday if I remember something and need to go somewhere. You're free to leave. Of course, you can't leave during a mission. It's a matter of the face mercenary unit's credibility. But after the mission is over, you can quit anytime you want. Just let us know before leaving. Understood. That night, the mercenary unit welcomed a client. This time, the mission was to escort a merchant from the Buten Trading Company. The payment was quite generous. The face mercenary unit had a good reputation in the industry, so they often received repeat business. Miles suddenly furrowed his brow. The numbers don't match, do they? Aren't there supposed to be more of you? I recently recruited him into the mercenary unit. He's a grade 4 copper badge mercenary named Helmut. Pyan patted Helmut's shoulder and pushed him forward. Fortunately, Helmut appeared mature for his age, so there wasn't an overwhelming sense that they had brought someone too young. Mr. Miles, have you been dissatisfied with our mercenary unit's performance in the past? We didn't bring him along just to please you. This young man is undoubtedly capable. Since joining the mercenary unit, this was Pyan's role, to handle situations like this. He wasn't chosen as the overall supervisor just because he was a grade 2 gold badge mercenary. His role was to handle such situations effectively. We will depart at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, so be prepared. He turned around and disappeared. Starting tomorrow, we will be working together with the Tariq Mercenary Corps. It's quite a large-scale mission with two Mercenary Corps involved. Other mercenaries who were listening and joined the conversation. If those Tariq Mercenary Corps guys pick a fight, just ignore them and move on. We don't get along well with them. Our side is doing better, and we have a better reputation, so they're probably dissatisfied. Still, we won't cause any trouble in front of the client. If it's just a minor dispute, let it slide. Helmut took out his wooden sword and found a place to practice. After one session of training, Helmut frowned and clenched and unclenched his hand. His body was drenched in sweat like rain. Pain surged through him as a result. Because of that, he had to slow down his movements, even slower than usual. However, after finishing his training, his body felt light and comfortable. My body is getting better. Helmut recalled Darian's teachings and decided that training beasts further today wouldn't be appropriate. The next day, Pine gathered the mercenaries before their departure. All right, let's go. It's an important mission, so don't let your guard down. They paid us generously for this. We should provide value equal to the money we received. Tanya smiled lightly. She, an experienced mercenary, was relaxed, and other third-grade mercenaries were the same. Only Pin seemed tense as it was his first mission. I feel like I'm going to vomit from what I ate this morning. Eating soup and bread three times the size of a regular plate for breakfast might have been a bit too much, making his stomach churn. Don't worry too much. We are one team. If you make a mistake, we will cover for you. Just focus on your duties, and you'll do fine. As the caravan reached a place where several wagons were lined up, Pyan immediately went to Miles to report. The third-grade mercenaries of the Face Mercenary Corps were positioning themselves according to their assigned spots. Tariq Mercenary Corps was responsible for the front, and Face Mercenary Corps had agreed the night before to position themselves at the back. Pin and Helmet were supposed to follow from behind, feeling a bit out of place. An escort mission. It involved guarding and transporting something. For Helmut, protecting something was unfamiliar territory, whether it be a person or an object. In the forest of Paha, the only thing Helmut had to protect was himself. He had nothing to lose and was the weakest among them. It must be something worth stealing, he thought. Helmut understood that much. It was a secretive mission, and he didn't know what they were transporting. Only Miles and the representatives of the mercenary corps knew the detailed travel route and destination. The mercenary, Kellop, said, I'm not fourth grade material, but due to my injury, I have no choice but to be in this state. I'm not on the same level as you. He displayed an attitude, making it clear that he wasn't happy to be in the face mercenary corps. By chance, their eyes met, and Kellop shouted, Why are you staring at me like that, little guy? Don't you know how to handle a sword? Pin felt upset, but he bit his lip and remained silent. Kellop sneered at him as he passed by. Coward, just follow behind us. It was an open provocation. This time, Kellop targeted Helmut. Is there a woman back there? 
Despite his refined appearance, shouldn't he be wearing a skirt? Helmut ignored him cleanly. He wasn't worth paying attention to. In truth, Kellop, despite being a third-grade mercenary, seemed weaker than Helmut had expected. His movements, gait, posture, and the amount of Vs he possessed. It was a trait of monsters that Helmut had naturally acquired, assessing the strength of others by observing their movements, gait, posture, and the amount of Vs they possessed. Knowing how strong the opponent was determined whether one would fight or not. Indeed, humans are different from monsters. They can hide their strength. Monsters emitted their magic outward, while Vs remained contained within the body. It was a few days of peaceful travel. Peacefulness meant boredom for some. It's so annoyingly boring. Kellop spat as he walked. The other three fourth-grade mercenaries around him eyed him warily. Kellop's brother was a second-grade mercenary in the Tariq Mercenary Corps. Following his brother, he had joined the Tariq Mercenary Corps as a third-grade mercenary and served his role reasonably well. He had a habit of getting into fights and had a penchant for gambling. This time, he got into a fight at a gambling den while drunk, breaking his arm in the process. His brother scolded him profusely and forced him to participate in this mission. It was practically a punishment to send him as a fourth-grade runner. If he resisted, he would be expelled for good. Cursed, who does he think he is? Kellop sharpened his knife. But if it weren't for his brother, he knew he wouldn't be tolerated with his mediocre skills and bad attitude. During their rest breaks, the two groups often encountered each other. When the runners went to fetch water from the river, or when they ventured into the forest to find horse fodder or firewood, their destinations often overlapped. Kellop didn't miss the opportunity. Whenever he passed by, he would trip someone or taunt them, spewing insults and profanities. He enjoyed watching Pin's irritated reactions. His reaction satisfied Kellop, but the situation changed when dealing with another boy in the group. His appearance was refined, and his skin was pale, making Kellop initially mistake him for a nobleman's child. He didn't even look like a fourth-grade mercenary. What's with the name Helmut? Sounds aristocratic. Looks like he's dressed up to play instruments at a party. Hey, hey, come over here. Carrying a bucket full of water and turning to leave, someone suddenly jumped out from behind. Kellop. It seemed like they had planned it all along, as four of them blocked the path. Kin, who was frowning, was grabbed by the back of his neck before he could turn around. Where does he get such strength? Kellop was strong not because of his swordsmanship, but because he was naturally powerful. Pin groaned, tears welling up in his eyes. Kellop, seemingly friendly, leaned over to Pin. Hey, hey, buddy. Have you ever taken a bath with him? Friends should have done that at least, right? That guy there, are you curious if he's a real woman or a man? Right, aren't you curious? Kellop had forcibly twisted his shoulders with his big hands. Oops, sorry, I accidentally applied too much force. So, are you curious too? Should I check for you? Kellop, in his excitement, shouted out. Go catch that guy. Let's see him strip in front of my friend. Kellop then beckoned his three fourth grade mercenary companions to surround Helmut. Just as one of them was about to lay hands on Helmut. What's going on here? A woman's voice rang out coldly. The owner of the voice stepped forward from the darkness. It was Tania. Damn it. Kellop's excitement quickly dissipated. He promptly let go of Pin. The three boys hesitated, then backed away from Helmut. Tania's face looked calm, but anger was evident in her eyes. I asked why the members of the Tariq Mercenary Corps, fourth grade mercenaries, were bothering our face Mercenary Corps, fourth grade mercenaries. The boys from the Tariq Mercenary Corps only stared at Kellop. Kellop waved his hand casually. We were just having a conversation, telling him to strip. I heard that, didn't I? No, well, among men, it's normal to do things like that while bonding. You probably wouldn't understand, right? Kellop laughed awkwardly. Tania ignored him and called out. Come here. Pin, Helmut. Pin jumped forward, hiding behind Tania, and Helmut came forward and stood next to her. His expression was as calm as ever, but his hand rested on the hilt of his sword at his waist. He could easily draw his sword at any moment. At this moment, Kellop felt a chill run down his spine. He had almost drawn his sword. All he had to do was pull it out. I'm originally a third-grade mercenary, but you're employed as a fourth-grade now. Is that wrong? Kellop realized that if he caused trouble, he might get expelled from the mercenary corps. Tania glared at them. Disperse immediately. The ruffians scattered like leaves in the wind. After they disappeared, Kellop's face turned red with anger. Pin, who had been hiding behind Tania, showed his face and sighed in relief. Thank you, Tania. It's nothing. I can't ignore something like that happening in our camp. Tania smiled gently at Pin, then turned her sharp gaze towards Helmut. Helmut, you should be careful too. Don't let your guard down. Thank you for your concern. Tania nodded and walked away. The next day, the Face Mercenary Corps continued their journey towards the frontier. 
The atmosphere in the camp was tense as everyone was on high alert. Even the experienced mercenaries couldn't maintain their tension all day. When it was time for lunch, they tended to relax a bit. In the middle of the procession, a third-grade mercenary from Tariq's mercenary group was flipping a water bottle upside down, trying to squeeze out the last drops. Why isn't any water coming out of this? He complained as he tilted his neck upwards, and at that moment, a shadow covered his sight. What's this? There was no time to draw his sword. Something from above, dropped from the tree shadows like a flash of light, tore into his exposed throat. Thunk, in an instant, a demon attacked the defenseless neck, tearing into it with a crunching sound. A horrifying liquid splattered as it hit the ground. It's a demon. Oh my goodness. Billy, Billy, with half of his neck missing, was already dead. His blood and flesh mixed as they flowed from the demon's jaws. It was a grotesque demon, resembling a giant monkey. Magic flowed from the demon and spread out softly and faintly. A demon rare to be seen in the outside world, strong enough to emit magical energy. The demon's face, with a satisfied smile, seemed to mock them. An excited mercenary, after witnessing his comrade's death, drew his sword and rushed towards the demon. Stop, if you rush in like that. A sharp scream echoed through the air. The sound of magic paralyzed their bodies. The demon lightly swatted away the sword with its nails, which were infused with magic. Then it swiftly plunged into the arms of the trembling mercenary. A chilling sound was heard. The demon's hand pierced through the mercenary's body, trained muscles giving way like paper, including the heart. With a satisfied expression, the demon held the still-beating heart like a toy, bouncing it in its palm and laughing sinisterly. The demon enjoyed killing. It also underestimated them. All these mercenaries. The mercenaries in front of him stiffened with tension. Their limbs trembled. The horrifying and gruesome scene in front of them filled them with fear. In the presence of this powerful demon, even trained mercenaries seemed like mere herbivores. Encountering such a formidable demon was rare even for experienced mercenaries. There was little information about this forest since hardly anyone passed through it. This demon is definitely stronger than I anticipated. Helmut thought calmly. He had no room to let his guard down. Perhaps I should step forward. Helma thought leisurely. A sharp glint appeared in his black eyes. He remembered the conversation among the mercenaries by the campfire before they slept. They said they would pay extra if we performed well in a crisis. Kin had expressed disappointment that their pay had been reduced. At the time, Helma didn't care, but if he could earn more, why not? There were many expenses in the human world. As a traveling mercenary, he needed travel expenses. Fighting a demon of this caliber was not a task for a fourth-grade mercenary. Doing more than his grade allowed would earn him a bonus. Miles also didn't want to be rash in this regard. It would be inconvenient if the person who promised the money died. The priority is the safety of the client. If someone who had promised money died, it would be troublesome. How are our level 4 mercenaries, Helmut and Finn? They're both unharmed. No one approached the carriage. Hey, you can come out now. Helmut pulled himself up from under the carriage and stood up. But Finn had no intention of coming out. Did he faint down there? While thinking that, a faint cry came from below. Helmut, looking inside, he saw Finn crouching with a pale face, extending his hand. Helmut, hey, I've got a cramp in my leg. Can you pull me out? Quickly, Helmut didn't bother hiding his pitiful expression. Good, everyone fought well. Let's check the carriage and handle the corpses. Monster corpses are worth much more than ordinary prey. We're lucky that none of our side suffered casualties. The mercenaries took out their axes and daggers and approached the fallen monster's corpses. Skins and teeth could be collected and sold for money. They were used as experimental materials for magicians or for making weapons. The harvest they obtained was taken to the Vuton market, where they received 70% of the earnings, and the rest was distributed among the mercenaries. The mercenaries were especially cautious when disassembling the monster's core, the dark sprout. Helmut's eyes flickered slightly. Tanya, who was working, gestured at Helmut and Finn. Hey, there's one over there. Work on it together. Finn looked nervous as he moved towards the corpse Tanya pointed to. Helmut was the same. However, as they got closer, an odd feeling came over him. Finn, why? Are you scared? It's fine. Finn, pretending to be brave, reached out to the corpse. At that moment, magic surged. A guy pretending to be dead. He revealed his true colors when Finn tried to touch him. Revealing his teeth, he aimed for Finn's throat. His movements were swift. Tanya, who had been watching them, shouted urgently. A glint of blackness emanated from his clenched fist. Without hesitation, Helmut slashed diagonally, cutting through the creature. What did I just witness? Tanya's eyes widened. The sword was so fast that the trajectory couldn't be seen. Helmut effortlessly kicked the fallen creature away, clearing it from his path. 
Hey, Helmut, thanks. I owe my life to you. I'll serve you a bowl of soup later. Finn was in charge of cooking, and he was quite good at it. That night, the group left the place where the bloody fight took place and stopped only late at night. The sentries will be divided into two and stand in three shifts. Helmut and Tanya, Finn and Marrows, Sean and Byrne. Uter is injured and will be out. The mercenaries, who were chatting cheerfully, had a shorter conversation than usual and went to bed. Everyone fell asleep in an instant. The sound of snoring echoed and time passed slowly. Helmut waited calmly. Every night, he had become accustomed to secretly going out and returning to practice this. Helmut got up from his seat and moved slowly. It was a route close to Tarek's mercenary group. A glance revealed that Kellogg was still awake. He surprisingly slept little and was diligent. He did this especially when it came to tormenting Finn and Helmut. Tired was a word that did not apply to Helmut and Kellop. Kellop appeared, blatantly making footsteps. A grin filled his face. Hey, kid. Is it dangerous to come into a place like this alone? We have to finish talking about what we couldn't say before. Kellop planned to beat and scold that expressionless face until it cried and its nose bled. Helmut didn't move. Kellop walked up to him and made a grim face. There's no one to help you in a place like this. It's not okay to hide under a girl's skirt. I thought you would follow me. What? Kellogg's eyes widened. Helmut's eyes were as still as the night. This is a good place to dispose of Kellop. If something goes wrong in a place like this, no one will suspect level 4 mercenary Helmut. Cold sweat broke out on Kellogg's forehead. You must be the one who is not afraid. Or stupid. This person. Maybe both. With a groan, Kellogg's knees were bent helplessly and hit the floor. Thud. Kellogg couldn't believe what was happening. What the hell is going on? This person. This is ridiculous. He was only a 14-year-old boy. There was no way a level 4 mercenary could do this to him. The guy was laughing at Kellogg with an expressionless face. Naturally, he couldn't accept it. His pride wouldn't allow it. Kellogg screamed and drew his sword. One of his strengths was that he was one of the best in Tarek's mercenary group. The sword Kellop swung cut through the air, making a terrifying sound. Helmut calmly drew his sword. One of his arms was broken and his balance was off. It is simple to avoid the sword that is thrown recklessly. Helmut's sword cut through Kellop's leg without friction. Just as Kellop stumbled, Helmut passed by him and stabbed him again from behind. Blood also flowed from the other leg where the tip of the sword penetrated. Helmut's movements were as fast as the wind. Fear flashed in Kellogg's eyes. Helmut, trotting towards the fallen man, looked like a reaper. Helmut gripped the handle of his sword tightly. A ferocious impulse boiled within his body. It's as if the patience I've had so far has turned into murderous intent, spreading out uncontrollably. I want to kill him by tearing him apart until his body is covered in blood. Kill it. Even if he dies anyway, no one will know. An evil, fierce cry echoing within me. You must not lose yourself. Darian's last words hit me on the head. Kellop tried to kill Helmut. Helmut killing him is not slaughter. The right thing to do. Helmut suddenly realized that his breathing had become rough. He took a breath and calmed himself. It was faster than the movements of my brother, a second-class mercenary. This is not a move that is possible for a 14-year-old boy. Blood was flowing from his legs, but Kellop, paralyzed with fear, felt nothing. He was running away using only his survival instinct. The will to survive moved his legs. As the camp got closer, Hope returned to Kellop. Kellop ran frantically, not even noticing that he suddenly stopped hearing the sound of grasshoppers. Kellop felt as if he had gone blind, his vision darkening to pitch black. Eternal darkness descended. Kellop could not even scream a single word, and his breath stopped. Helmut's step stopped. His eyes were looking straight into the darkness. It's him. As expected, it appeared again. A familiar figure emerged from the darkness, turning away from the light of the campfire. Giant monkey. That's mine. Helmut stopped and spoke. It was a surprisingly calm voice. You've just stolen something from me. Helmut spoke clearly once again. His eyes were more sunken than usual. Helmut was a little angry. The monkey monster looked at Helmut as if observing him. He was a small human compared to his body. The flesh is soft and the bones are thin. Although he was human, he felt vaguely like a monster. If you attack me, you will die. Helmut spoke briefly. Monsters know how to compare the strength of their opponents. Helmut made eye contact with the bastard and revealed his vis, which was mixed with faint magical energy. He let out a roar filled with demonic energy as if threatening. There was a buzz and noise in the campsite. Humans who had woken up were armed and approaching the direction from which the cries were heard. Humans are food. That's the instinct engraved into the monster. An ordinary monster would not have been able to see that the human in front of him was strong and would have followed his instincts, but his high intelligence held him back. 
pride, intelligence, and instinct clashed dizzyingly. Meanwhile, the mercenaries with torches in their hands were getting closer. Helmut sighed. I felt half glad and half sad. He was left alone. Helmut tried to organize in his head how to explain this situation. As he walked toward the camp, someone spotted him on the other side and shouted. Who is there? Who is it? Is it a person? It's me. Helmut raised his hand. Thank you for watching. Subscribe and enable notifications so you don't miss the next chapter.